He, he said those words, the very words in the song. I don't know what God. The Holy God. Spirit. Yeah. What do you know? That's cool. The other song was... Very good. How that fits. When are you going to do that one? We did that one. No, last night. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So can I kiss? Thank you. No, thank you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but you, no, that's that's a really good. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Praise Team. Uh, they've been practicing the last couple of weeks, and I'm so happy to have Stephanie and our, our church step up this year and help out the Praise Team. And uh, what a wonderful morning it has been, and especially with Mr. Kenneth Mickey. And uh, up next is a, a gentleman I've known all my life. The first time I met him, I met his son. His name is Andrew, and we were the Andrews in camp. <laughs> grew up together and it's so great to have you back this year and the family and uh, so happy. Um, after uh, Brother Bissell, we're going to need uh, some help. Um, we're going to have our uh, fellowship and potluck. If you didn't bring anything, don't worry about it. Um, there's somebody within the church that donated some food and just want to have some extra food. Enjoy it. We have waters. We have apple juice in the back. We got water in the back. So, amen. If you need anything, just let us know. And it's in the cooler back there. So, so up next, I'm looking forward to hearing from Mr. Ivan Bilson, Ivan Bissell, and he's from St. Helen's Church of Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I know you heard me the first time, but thank you for responding. Thank you for being here. It's good to, to be back this year. We missed last year because we planned to, a trip to Reno during the time Coos Bay was, and by the time Coos Bay uh, rolled around, we'd already had prior commitments. A lot of change in the building, and some of the people have changed, and we're good, glad to see those who are regular and still with us today. So we're thankful for each one of you here. This morning, I want to uh, I want to share some information with you. I had something planned, but two key characters are missing right now, so I'm going to hold off on that for for just a moment. But what I would like to do again is to to alert us to the theme of the message and where my messages come from. The theme of the rally is following Jesus as we continue being his disciples. Now, that's certainly something important that we should do is to follow Jesus. Is there anything more important in life than to follow Jesus? You and I know people that follow sports and they can give you every statistic that there is, but they can't name the books of the Bible of the New Testament, let alone the Old Testament. Or if they get them, they're out of order, but they know statistics because they follow them. That has become their livelihood. That has become their interest. Don't you think that there are more things more important than that? And when I say things, I'm talking about scriptural things, following Jesus, fellowship and with his people, being a fanatic of church, cheering the church on, you know, doing that kind of stuff, fellowshipping 
is a part of it. So we're going to look at, I want us to notice two things from that theme. And I want to draw out some things from this theme this morning. The first one is following. The second one is continuing. Following and continuing. Now we want to do both of those things this morning. So if you take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy, Timothy was exhorted to continue in what he was doing or to continue in his following by continuing his service to God. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. It says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convicted of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Do you see the exhortation there? You continue in the things that you learned from when you were a child. The older I get, the harder it is for me to memorize scripture. And that's not just me. That's people my age, some a little younger than me. But when you're a child, your mind is multiple, it's pliable, you can memorize things. And isn't it amazing for, I remember going to Bible college, one of the first things they did is have, have the guys or, and, and have them teach the children's church or children's classes. And you know, if you put one thing out of order, they're going to let you know. <laughs> they're innocent, but they're going to let you know. That's not the way it is. That's not the way mom and dad taught us. That's not the way the preacher said it or, or whatever. They're innocent, but they've molded their minds and they remember that. And they're going to put you in, their, in your place. So that hopefully, maybe next time you'll do better. You have to walk lightly around those because they're going to they're gonna let you know. And we do it out of love, um, out of innocent, and out of... Okay, go back and sit with your mom and dad. Okay. You know, so, <laughs> children are like that. But we see that Timothy was receiving marching instructions, in a sense. He says, continue on. And you might say he was in boot camp. Continue on. These are your marching orders to do this. And he was continuing on. But I want to tell you this. A person won't follow anyone or anything very long if they don't have faith in it and they don't have an assurance, assurance that this is going to work. You start following somebody, following anything, and it fizzles. You don't have much assurance, much faith in it. Now, I do want to take a break right here. The key figures I was waiting on have showed up. Brother Steve yesterday said, you won't see me with a tie very much. I thought, I didn't even bring a tie. But then, before he leaves, Brother Steve, I have a tie. Right here. I have a tie. So, he's not out doing it. And even uh, when ties go wide, I could go with tie, so I can just tie. Secondly, Brother Steve said we're celebrating something special. Today is my wife and I's 40. Fifth wedding anniversary. Oh, All right. All that. Okay. Anyhow, that was for free. That one person me. There, getting back to where we should have been. There's so much confusion out there as to what a real leader is. Whether it's a president, whether it's whoever it is, who the real leader is. Because they have been led astray or they're leading others astray. And so we have to question, do I want to put my faith, my trust, my loyalty in that leader? Because they've, they've not proven themselves. And a lot of times, sadly, it's because whoever gets the most media coverage is who the people follow. Doesn't mean they're right, does it? Because the media likes to follow the bad things. They like to follow evil. They like to follow those who are popular. And sometimes popularity comes at the price of being wrong, at the price of being crooked and cheating and stealing. But that has become the norm, it seems like. And so when you talk about something, somebody does some good, that gets very little coverage. But when somebody does something bad, that makes the news. And people follow that. 
They follow the headlines. They follow the stories. I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder who they're going to be unfaithful with next. I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder what destruction they're going to do. Well, might does not make right any more than certain consensus means that it's right. Well, everybody, you know, the consensus is, well, the consensus was wrong when it came to the crucifixion of Jesus, wasn't it? Everybody, for the most part, said, crucify him. And even Pilate himself was it three times he said, I find no fault, I find no guilt. But the general consensus was crucify him, and so he's crucified. I realized that was God's plan for salvation, but the consensus doesn't always make it right. So it depends, you know, who you follow. The louder you yell, the more attention you get. You ever go to, not, I hope you don't go to a riot, you ever see a riot? And somebody, you know, cause a riot? You ever go to a riot? Or, <laughs> let's start over again. You ever see a riot and somebody down a bullhorn, you know? They're the loudest ones and, and you just have a bunch of people repeating what they say. And half, half those people at the riot, I have no idea why they're there. But there's a lot of people here, there must be something. Oh, let's take up the chant, let's take up the call. Uh, and, and the cause. Well, just because there's a large following does not mean that everyone should jump on the bandwagon. You've heard the illustrations about lemmings jumping into the sea. We're not lemmings. But yet people are lemmings. They will follow blindly, not knowing where they're going, and before you know it, they're over the cliff with everybody else. Because it looked right. The vast majority going through the broad gate like Kenneth talked about, it looks like this should be the way. It's smooth, it's broad, it's popular. People have been there for it. This way over here is tight and it's crooked and it's bumpy and the path is not so well worn. Let's just go down with the majority and the majority of the people follow the majority. So as Christians following Jesus, we must be ready and willing to, willing to follow his marching orders. Are you, have you decided to follow his marching orders? If you're here today, if you're serving him faithfully, you are in his army. Maybe you didn't know it, but you're in following his marching orders. If you've been in the military, you've probably been told where to go, when you're going, and how long you're going to be there. My understanding is if you put in, I want to go here, well, they send you there. Yeah. Assuring you you're going to go here, when in reality, they knew you were going to go there. I've heard, don't ever ask for what you want, because you're not going to get it anyhow. But your marching orders are, this is what you want, but this is reality. This is it. I want you to go in your Bibles to Luke, the ninth chapter. Luke 9, verse 57. Luke 9, 57. As they were going along the road... Someone to say to him, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a broad statement. I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Kind of like, and you still want to go? And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You see the priorities there? Permit me first. I am making an excuse, but I need to take care of this business first and twice. They said, permit me first to do this. And he basically said, you know, if you're plowing, anybody here do any plowing in their life or anything like that? You plow in your life and, and you try to, if you don't have the GPS like they have now, you set your eye on that goal, that far tree, that far fence post, and you drive for it. And you usually have pretty straight roads. But when you turn around, you might as well, you're going to be in the ditch. you got a gutter ball, whether you wanted to or not. You're in the ditch. No man looking back. You've got to keep your eyes facing forward on the goal if you want straight lines. So he tells them that. People, too many people want to follow God, but it's on their own terms. 
Allow me first. Permit me first. Like they want to declare the conditions in their service to God. I want to dictate to God. I will follow you if I can do this. If I don't have to give up that. If, if, if I can get away with partial service. It's kind of like stepping out of the boat with one foot. But I'm going to keep one foot inside the boat. You straddle the fence. It doesn't work that way. They want to make their own declaration. And sometimes it's a declaration of independence from God. Or it's a non-dependency on God. One of the biggest lies, and I think it was Brother Raymond brought this up. One of the biggest lies, or somebody did, that people have believed is, I may be thinking about it earlier, just now, all of your heart. Isn't that soft and mushy and disgusting? Just fall in your heart. Do you know what it says about the heart in Jeremiah 17? Turn there to 17.9 and you'll find a way, reason to not follow the heart. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Yes. I test the mind even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. You and I have a sick heart to tell somebody, just follow your heart. Do as you, do as you please. Appease your conscience. Just If it feels good, do it. You're following your heart. Well, you're going to violate God's laws. You're going to violate somebody's face or somebody. You're going to do, but it feels good to me. Isn't that rather selfish? Taking care of myself first. And that's the society we live in. You've got to look out for number one, and you are number one. And your failures are blamed on number two on down. Your family, your teacher, your, your country, your whatever. Just so you look good. Follow your heart. And so many people believe that. Well, my heart, and, and what they, in my heart, I think you can say, in my heart, I, you know, I feel like I, but where does it say that in the Bible? Talks about the heart. We just read one. There's many others. We just read one. I, I'll give you a personal illustration. I remember a couple of our kids wrestling. I'll call one underdog. Another one I'll call top dog. Obviously, top dog would literally be on top, pinning underdog down. <laughs> underdog knew that defeat was close, so the bargaining began. Underdog tried to set the terms of the match. Let go of this hand. No, you're just going to hit me. Just let go. No, just do it. Top dog says, okay. Okay, I'm going to let go, but you better not hit me. I won't hit you, underdog says. Top dog lets go, and underdog punches top dog. <laughs> you said you wouldn't punch me if I let go of your hand. No, I said I wouldn't hit you. I punched you. <laughs> Top Dog says, now you're not getting up forever. Underdog says again, look at this hand. Look at that hand. Top Dog says, do I look stupid? Underdog says, yes. <laughs> Top Dog punches Underdog. Now both dogs are in the doghouse. <laughs> On their own terms. Look, look at this hand. Why? I know you're going to hit me or punch me or something. People want to serve God that way. God, just let me make the terms. Let me fight my battle without the sword, without the word, without the rest of God's army. My brothers and sisters, just let me do it my way. Well, like Kenneth says, our arms are too short when God's there to fight our battles. But people are like that. Some people want to write the laws and to give out the sentences if there's any sense at all. Okay, they did offend us. Maybe we should just pull them out for whatever, a short period of time or whatever. Rather than, no, they need to rebuke, they need to repent, they need to make things right. Public offense, public apology, things like that. No, let's just kind of do this in secret. You ever known somebody that did a public sin and repented in private? Because it's too embarrassing to repent publicly. Is that right? I, I, I believe a public sin, it should have a public apology. Things should be made right. Like sometimes if I, in our 45 years, it may have been one, well, okay, there's several times that 
I may have raised my voice at my wife. And then I, I come back and I'm sorry. And the thought is, say you're sorry as long as you, whatever the offense was. Well, it's embarrassing and humiliating to, to do that. So sometimes people would rather get into, well, I just want to make things right. But I don't want it known how bad I was, how rotten I was. Well, it's probably already known. But sometimes people, to be more precise, sometimes Christians try to plea bargain with God about going to war against the devil and sin. We have a preacher for that. I don't have to do that. We have a song leader for that. We have two people to teach class. I don't have to do that. We have plenty. You know what burnout is? Mm-hmm. It's when those couple of people get burnt out because they keep doing it and doing it. But God, they're good at it. I'm not that good. Practice. Get into God's word every day. Practice with those little kids that are going to tell you how wrong you are. <laughs> Practice. That's a good place to start because it's all out without a breeze. Most of them don't tell you, at least not during the class, not during the sermon. But I've been told sometimes after a sermon where I had literally made a mistake. I don't mind because I don't claim to be inspired. I am still human. I make mistakes. I want you to go to John the 6th chapter. John 6 and verse 60. John 6, 60. We're going to do a little bit of bouncing around, but we'll do 6, 60 and 61. John 6, 60. Therefore, many of the disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this Cause you to stumble. Now, who was he talking to? The multitudes or his disciples? His disciples who were handpicked, who were hand selected, who were to go out and disciple others, found this statement difficult. When they heard this, they said, Who can listen to it? I don't get it. Drop down to verse 66 of that same chapter. As a result of this, many of the same who his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Many withdrew, fortunately some stayed, the disciples split up here. When, when the heat was turned on, some melted away. They withdrew. And then they say, uh, and we're, we're not walking with him anymore. I don't know that they ever came back. But they made that clear. If it's not my terms, I can't follow you. And Jesus was saying, you know, certain things and basically uh, do it this way. This is hard to understand. This is hard to take. I don't, I don't think I can give this up. I really like this, whatever it is, this sin, this, this addiction, and it doesn't even have to be drugs. I, I really like this. I don't think the Lord's going to really count me out if I hang on to that. Well, if you put it before God, he certainly is, isn't he? Maybe such and such is not a bad thing until you put it between you and God. Until it becomes your God, your idol. And that's what you prioritize. And so you, you withdraw. I'll, do, I'll just, you know what I'll do? This Church of Christ in Coos Bay, they don't allow me to do such and such, so I'm going to go to another church, and I'm going to go to another church, and to another church, until I find somebody that doesn't condemn me and my sins, doesn't, that, that doesn't say I'm wrong in what I'm doing. I wonder how often they crack their Bible. Yeah. To find out what God says. Yeah. The Bible says it's wrong. Mm-hmm. The Church of Christ in, in Coos Bay or St. Helens or Reno or other places, you know, say it's wrong. They're saying it because the Bible says so. But people like to do it under their terms. I finally found a church where they're not going to condemn me for, and it's a very blatant sin. That doesn't mean it's right. It's a huge congregation. Everybody's going there. Yeah. It's got the it's got the broad way, doesn't it? They have a ministry for this and ministry for that. We had several people walk in our door and walk out after one service because we didn't have a, a, 
and I'm, uh, some churches have this, we didn't have this ministry, we didn't have that ministry, because by the time we would have had 12 different ministries, there would have been nobody in the congregation. <laughs> you can't have more ministries than you do congregation, than you do people. And so because they saw that, they maybe agreed with our doctrine, but you just don't, uh, you don't have anything for me. The Bible's for you. Amen. The adult class is for you. Amen. The children's class is for your kids. You know, fellowship is for you. We have something for you. But you've got to be willing to eat and partake. I can't force feed you any more than anybody else can force feed you. You've got to want it. Yeah. Well, some Christians are fearful of the outcome of the battle, forgetting whom they enlisted under. Because of what we may go through, there are times when we will be afraid. If I were to ask you to show me your hands and say, how many of you have ever been afraid in your Christian life in, in certain circumstances, many of you would raise your hands. Just this morning, I talked to two individuals that encouraged me, get up front and speak. God loves you. Actually, it's three now. I think it was my wife included. Speak. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I don't know why I'm nervous. But these are God's people. I'm glad I'm not speaking to a whole room of convicts. Or enemies. There are no convicts here, right? Nobody ever offers to throw at me. Song books at the least. All right. Um, it's okay to be afraid as long as we don't let that range. So I want you to, and, 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 and let's look at Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, and I'll explain a little bit more why I'm saying what I'm saying. Isaiah 43, 2. Some people will take this literally, literally. Um, let, let's read it. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will a flame burn you. I didn't go out to Bassendorf yesterday for the uh, last night for the marshmallow roast, but I don't think you had anybody walk through the fire pit, did you? Anybody that went? Probably not. Well, it says right here, I won't get scorched while they're doing marshmallows right at my feet. That's not what it says. The, the speaking this morning about stepping out of the boat into the water. I can't swim. I don't like even a big mud puddle. I will step out around that because that thing might swallow me up. <laughs> I have fear of water. So I can't say, well, I'm not going to drown. I don't know how to swim, but I'm going to go out here to the beach and I'm going to jump in. Yeah. And the Lord's going to save me. The Coast Guard is nearby. There's boats nearby. There's swimmers nearby. There's surfers nearby. Somebody's going to save me. See that scripture I'm taking and I'm, I'm twisting it. doesn't mean it's right. The rivers, they won't overflow you. But I think what it's telling you is fear not, I am with you. Yeah. I will take care of you. These things, and, and don't take it literally, but just so you can understand, let me put it in words so you can understand about the waters, about the rivers, and about the fire, and the flame, these things. So some people, again, want to do it on my terms. Well, God said this way. I can't believe God let me drown. I guess it would be not speaking much. Uh, I can't believe God let me get burned so bad. Because it says right here. And you do have, you have fire walkers or, or, or things like that, people that do that. But it's, that's a whole other sermon. Deuteronomy, let's go back to the Old Testament even further, way far into the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 20. We're scared. We're afraid. Even big, valiant warriors. You heard Mike's illustration yesterday about the valiant warriors that held their hand up so that their hand and the sword wouldn't be baptized with the rest of their wood. Here's some soldier, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies, okay, you don't fight your friends. You shouldn't fight your friends. So you're going to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you are outnumbered. They have more tanks than we do. They have more whatever Humvees than we do. Do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt, is with you. When you're approaching the battle, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Listen up. You're in the heat of the battle. You remember the pep talk I gave you last week? This is today. You're going to battle today. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. The Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Did you ever do battle, so to speak, when you're a child? And you had a big brother or something or dad that would back you up. You're not afraid of anybody. 
you can take on that neighbor girl and you don't have to care about it. I mean, you don't have to worry about that bully picking on you if your older brother stood up for you or your mom or your dad or your uncle. It's like God right here. In the last verse four, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will fight with you. You just kind of stand up a little bit straighter. Start running on. And then you duck out of the way. <laughs> and God, with the long arms, is going to do your battle for you. But you're afraid. It said, don't be faint hearted. Telling this to, it sounds like, to warriors, to men of valor, valiant men, strong men, men who were in the military, who either made it their, their, uh, um, made their living this way, they're forced into it. Nonetheless, you don't pick sissies to go on the front line. Because they don't last very long. They either get wiped out or they'll turn and run. But even these were faint-hearted, no doubt. They must have been afraid. They must have been panicking and trembling in front of the people, of the enemy. Until they should have brought to my own back. We have a secret weapon. We have the biggest weapon there is there's God on our side. And so if you go to the uh, th 31st chapter of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Here's something we need to remember is to be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and tremble at them. For the Lord your God is one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. You get the idea here that there are still some trembling going on? Still some, some people that are not as courageous as they should be? They're afraid they tremble. Let me remind you it is the Lord God who goes with you. Has he ever forsaken you and failed you? He will not fail you or forsake you. Yeah. I like words of encouragement. You've been through this. You've got this. You can do this. You can unite as a congregation and make your way through this. Better times are probably coming, but you're gonna be, uh, the storm is coming. If you haven't been through a storm, you must be pretty new, but the storm is coming. The idea is to be warned in advance. Well, I know who goes with me in that boat. And even when he's not in the boat, I know who's going to meet me out on the stormy sea. Because the Lord is with me. All right now, New Testament book of Matthew, the 10th chapter, Matthew 10. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Matthew 10, 28, do not fear. It comes right off the bat in this verse. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill a soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So say how somebody may kill the body. Don't fear that. I, I, I really don't want to be killed. I'd rather meet the Lord naturally. But if it, you know, I even need to take courage here. Do not fear. Um, verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Sparrows are not the, not the highest on any uh, you know, buddy spectrum for the most part. There's some pretty sparrows that have some pretty songs, but they're, they're very small. And it seems like nobody would care if the cat got one or if they fell out of the nest. Nobody would know except God. And, and, then, and then back then they would sell two sparrows for a, for a penny. That's not much value for two. That's a half cent each. But God is concerned about them. And if he's using that as comparison, if he loves his creation that much, how much more do you think he loves you who has an eternal soul? Who he gave his life, or he didn't give his life for the life, for the sparrows, but yet he cares for them. You not fear because you're more valuable than all the sparrows, all the birds, all the creatures. Because you only, mankind is the only one that has an eternal soul because they have the breath of life, breathe into his nostrils from creation. The animals, people say they go to rainbow heaven, they go to doggy heaven, whatever, all good dogs go to heaven or whatever. Doesn't leave much of a choice for cats, but the fact is, though, that they don't have eternal souls either. They don't even have nine lives. If they, but we, as Christians, do. So don't fear. Be 
because you're more valuable than any of his creation from the from the biggest although he just used you as a one of the smallest of his creation in exodus the 20th chapter we're talking the israelites here coming out of egypt and, and i believe they're at mount sinai anyhow let's go to exodus 20 18. exodus 20 18 it says all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Now, if I remember right, they were already told, don't get near, don't touch the mountain, don't pass this boundary. You ever been in the middle of a thunderstorm and you just knew you're going to be the next tall object struck or your car or your, your house or something? That rumbling thunder, that flash of lightning that just blinds you and, and the thunder deafens you. And then if it turns into rain or heavy hail, that's scary. That it even rains from out of here in Reno. It rains in, it rains in Reno one time. Do you ever have storms like this that sometimes scare? Okay, All right. I was gonna ask you last night, how's your ocean in Reno? Huh? Well, Oregon has an ocean, Nevada doesn't, but I won't go there. <laughs> I won't go there. Where was I? Let's go back to the verse 19. They 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 stood at a distance, 19. Then they said to Moses, speak. Speak to us yourself and, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. That's a sad situation when you want to hear God's word. I, I understand the circumstances and Moses were familiar, familiar with because he's one of us, as the Israelites could say, but they were God's people. God had already half delivered them. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. Here they were. They speak to us because when we hear from God, we're going to die. Moses said to them, verse 20, do not be afraid. I wonder if he was trembling, shaking. D -d 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 don't be afraid. Maybe don't follow my example, but you know, lock your knees. Don't be afraid. For God has come in order to test you and in order that you, that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Okay, okay so you can be fearful of sinning against God that you may not sin, verse 21. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Hopefully they were listening, they took it to heart. We know that they were kind of flip-flop and they did good for a while and then they got themselves in trouble and they rebelled and where's our leader and where's God and it would have been better to stay back in Egypt and now we're dying of thirst, we're dying of hunger and all these things. Wait a minute, you're following the God of the food ministry. You're, you're following God. He can provide food out of nothing. He doesn't have to go to a food bank or have food donations. He is God. So the people stood and Moses approached. Well, the thing about fear is that courage conquers, fear fails. So many things have, have come to failure because people were afraid to take that first step out of the boat, take that first step climbing the mountain, take that first step of the journey, that first mile. Well, I, I'm just pretty sure that I'm going to have troubles down the road or on the mountaintop or, or out on the lake. And so, therefore, they never go. They never make it because they allow fear to ruin their lives. A lot of my family have never, my family I grew up with, have never left Nebraska. And I don't know if they're fearful, but they're, it's familiar. I guess I did have a brother go to Job Corps, Montana. My oldest brother's a truck driver, but my brother that passed away hardly got, I don't know if he got out of Nebraska more than Wyoming and Colorado, and that was about it. He didn't do much. I think part of his was a fearful situation, but some people are like that. Well, I'm, I'm afraid to explore, to be adventurous, to check it out. Sometimes you, you, you gotta have faith. You gotta conquer those fears because fear, you're definitely gonna fail. I'll never make it, well, not if you don't try. Not if you don't try. Let's go to Joshua. And I bet we're gonna be talking about Joshua in the fifth chapter. Joshua, Jericho, Joshua 5, 13. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went, to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? I'm gonna tell you this, if I saw somebody with a switchblade pulled in a dark alley, I wouldn't go up and say, hey, you wanna be my friend? Will you be my neighbor? Yeah, I wouldn't do that. But 
Anyhow, are you for us or are you one of our adversaries? He said, no, rather, I indeed now come as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to, to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing, uh, place where you are standing is holy. So Joshua did so. You see the courage that it took to go out and face this man with the sword? And the man with the sword says, No, we're friends, but take off your shoes, you're in holy ground. Does that sound like another Old Testament character? Mm -hmm. If I don't have him in this sermon, he's coming up. Stay tuned. If he's not in this sermon, he'll be coming up. So I want you to go up again a little bit further in the book of Joshua. We're going to the fifth or the sixth chapter. We're talking more about Jericho, Joshua 6, 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out, nobody came in. Okay, there's this multitude of people. These We've heard about these Israelites that are coming. Close the doors. Lock everything up. Put people on the wall. Prepare for battle. Verse 2, the, the Lord said, Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with his kings and valiant warriors. They looked at them, valiant warriors. Yeah. They didn't go out, but they were going to protect their city from within. Jericho was a pretty well fortified city. Here's the marching instruction. Now this doesn't make sense in verse three. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do this for six days. I would scratch my head and say, what? <laughs> We're warriors, not marchers. This is not a track meet. Or you want us, do you know how many of us there are? Do you know how long it takes? The group that starts, would probably be done before the rear part gets a start. And you want us to do this six times? Question the Lord. Question. Drop down to verse 5. It shall be that when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and, all, and the, the people will go up every man straight ahead. That doesn't sound like a War plan anybody's used before. We got these horns, we got the noise. Okay, verse 7. Then the people, then he said, The people go forward and march around the city. Let the armed men go on before the ark of the Lord. I don't know if man all the armed men, but the armed men go first. It sounds like the, the um, maybe I should say defenseless, are going to follow. Verse 10. But Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout. Or, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you, shout! Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once. Then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Now Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. Verse 14, thus the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did so for six days. 15, then on the seventh day they rose early at the dawning of the day. I marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day they marched around the city uh, seven times. At the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Shouting was a part of it. I mean, let them know you're here. Shout, blow the horns. Drop down verse 20. So the people shouted, the priest blew the trumpets, and when the People heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep <coughs> and donkey, with the edge of the sword. Talk about weird marching orders, but when God said, do it, they listened. They probably had a lot like that. Like, this doesn't make any sense. I know I'm not a, a captain, I know I'm not a whatever, a veteran or whatever, but to march around the city and all this around, you know, we got all these people, and you want us to be quiet. It's, it's hard sometimes mm -hmm. keeping a few quiet, but everybody's supposed to be quiet. And they evidently were as quiet as it could be, and they followed God's orders. And guess what? The plan worked. It paid off to follow God's marching orders. When God tells us to march, we need to be careful that we listen to his orders. Maybe we should ask, where? And not, not out of, out of uh, uh, irritation, where? You know, you're curious, where do you, where do you want me to go, Lord? Wherever you lead, I'll go. 
When do you want me to go? How long do you want me to stay? And various things like that. Because they're his marching orders to us. We're his people. Would there have been a victory if the people had not followed or had given it? Forget it, I'm not going. I'll let the other 10,000 or however many there were, I'll let the others go. This is my day off. I don't have to go around the city. Let the priests do it. Let those others do it. Let everybody else but me. My doubt's kicking in. I just don't think I can make it. Or, or some excuse like that. Well, I believe it took the obedience of everybody to have a complete victory. A victory that had never been accomplished before and the walls tumbled down. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? The people obeyed. For those of us who've been a Christian for any length of time, we know that God never leaves us, leads us somewhere where he is not at. You go there, God says, but I'm going to stay out. That's not my territory. Well, the whole universe is his. If he sends you somewhere, he's there. He'll meet you there. Or you said he's already there. He'll meet you there. But oftentimes we look and we can't with the, with the physical eye or we can't with the eye of our hearts think and see that God is there. And then we get there and the victory won. It's like, wow, I should, I should have had more faith. I should have trusted you from the beginning. I should have paid attention to your marching orders. And speaking of marching orders, we know those who started the march, but they, uh, uh, what do you call it, when they leave AWOL, they went AWOL. Or they joined the other side. This is just too rough. I can't. I would rather live for the devil than live for the Lord. And so they desert the Lord's army. And they, they, uh, they would rather follow the devil's marching orders because the end is destruction. But it looks good. If I, I, I think the saying used to be uh, when I was a kid, if I go out young, I want to go out with a bang. I want to go out in flames or something like that, something dumb like that. But I thought, you know, looking back now, I'm thinking, but you could have a whole life where you could eat somebody some good, except for you're living in the moment and you want to make a big flash. Well, so what? Once that flash is gone, it's like a firecracker. It blows up. But once it's burnt, you don't really like that firecracker. There's no more life in that firecracker. You'll not get another bang out of the firecracker. But I'm up out of that with a flash. Really? What about a steady burning? You know, maybe a, even beyond a Roman candle or something like that. Something like a, a campfire that continues to glow and continues to warm those up around you. Continues to ignite others because of their ember. You know, what about that? Why don't you continue living on and use your spark for the Lord? I like this verse, the Psalms, the 23rd chapter. You know it very well. So I won't, I won't read verse 1 because I want to make some points in, in the next few verses. Verse 2, Psalm 23, 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. You know what that means? It means that I go where he directs me. I am leadable. There is somebody leading me. And then verse 3, he restores my soul. He guides me. He leads me. He guides me. Sometimes it's follow me. And then sometimes as you go back and take him by the hand and, and he guides you. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. It's like, again, having your dad, your big brother, somebody with you. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'm familiar with these things. The protection or, or whatever the direction of the rod of the staff. But he leads me, he guides me. He is with me. Because his marching orders are go. And who am I to question? You know, when I think about walking in Genesis 5 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. How'd you like to be walking with God and all of a sudden? You know, walking with God on this earth, all of a sudden with God, you can, and God took you. I don't know that I fully understand this other than it wasn't a time warp, it wasn't space travel per se, as the sci-fi movies, but God took him. But the main important thing was that he was following God's marching orders and he was walking with God. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden, in the cool of the day. Talk about fellowship. You know, the cool of the day or the early morning, 
sometimes we have fellowship in our devotions, but to think, and, and my understanding is they're in the garden, seeing God, or, you know, walking with God, whatever that meant. Noah walked with God in Genesis 6, 9, and then um, there's other scriptures here, I won't, won't go there. I, I think the one where a walk of faith, God's marching orders told Abraham, go to this mountain and make a sacrifice. And so he and his son and some of the other servants, and even his son questioned God, uh, uh, a dad, here's, here's the wood, here's the fire, but where's the animal sacrifice? And, and Abraham, by faith, it says, I believe in Hebrews, by faith he, he carried through with this. He said, son, God will provide. I think, I would have said that with a lump in my throat, because I don't see a lamb. I don't see a ram. I don't see a bullock. I don't see. I don't see pigeons. I don't see anything. But son, God will provide. He said, "Walk," and they walked well, over the three days' journey to get there. And then they told the they told the servants, "Park the park the donkeys here. The son and I will go and worship, and we will return." What did he mean by that? We we still probably in his mind. I don't know how it's going to work out because we still don't have a sacrifice. But God said, "March." God said, "Go." So he went, and he got this close to making a human sacrifice. But Abraham, and it's kind of in his righteousness, Abraham followed God's marching orders to that close. Sacrificing his one and only son. Do you see a parallel there with God sacrificing his one and only son? Except for God did not stop the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus' marching orders would go, teach and preach and do this for three years, but know at the end that they will crucify you. Jesus even told his disciples many times, I go to Jerusalem toward the last, I'll go to Jerusalem, but basically I'm not coming out. We go here, and it's kind of funny, it's something that the, uh, what's it, uh, Judas, one of them said, well, if he wants to go to Jerusalem, we should go with him too. Like, well, you know, I'm not sure if I want to go there. But he told him many times, this is what I mean. The Son of Man is going to be crucified. And then he told him in John, but I'm going, to, I'm going to send you a helper. I won't leave you alone. But the thing about it is that we're marching as disciples now for these three years. But when I'm gone, you continue marching. Did that work? Read the book of Acts. They continued marching on in the book of Acts. Read the rest of the New Testament beside the four Gospels. You know that the marching orders were carried on. And so when God says, go, we go. I'm going to get down here some more bit. I got enough here. I want to close with this scripture this morning, 3 John, the first chapter, verse 4. It says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now you can take that literally. You know, Andrew talked about how when we first met his family, he and our son Andrew were best friends. This Andrew is still walking with the Lord. Our son Andrew is not. The other five children are walking with the Lord. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in the Lord, are walking in the truth. It's a good feeling to know that the same gospel, the same truths we told our Andrew was the same things that our other five children believe and still serve God. And so in the marching order to say, if there's like a casualty in the family, so to speak, you still march on. You know, it's not like, well, something, you know, maybe, we, maybe our Andrew has it right. No, he doesn't. We told him before he left, Andrew, you're going to hell if you don't get things right. With you and God, you know what is right. You were baptized into Christ and probably up at one of the camps or after one of the camps that Mike Kennedy taught at, taught at up there at Clear Lake. I think almost every one of our kids were either baptized at Clear Lake or shortly after they attended their camp at Clear Lake and Mike was one, one of the main speakers there. They had the same gospel. They had the same parents. They had the same schooling. They had the same thing. But one chose to not go with the marching orders. And he followed the broad. I don't know where he is today. You know, there was a couple months when we lived in the apartment complex, the same one we did, and we didn't even know he lived there. But, uh, that was probably 15 years ago, but the fact is, though, that there's that broad and narrow that looks good. 
But the little contact we had with them, we found out that your friends are not friends at all. Who would roll you out on, on Pittsburgh Vernonia Road in the middle of the night because you passed out in their car? Roll you out on the road and drive off. And some lady drive up and think you're an animal or something, find out you're a human being, and so thankful that she didn't run over him. And then when Carrie, I think it was Cassie, went to, to pick him up or something, she said, what kind of friends do you have? Well, well, who would do that to you? And he said, well, that's my friends. Huh? And she said, what kind of friends would roll you out when you're passed out, whether it's drugs or alcohol? You call them your friends? No, no, not that bad. I don't want friends like that. I don't want friends that roll me up out of the car. I mean, I wouldn't be in that condition now, but you see where I'm going with that? But the marching orders are, no matter what, you continue on. You, you, we know what our goal is, and we're trying to plow that straight line because our goal is not a tree, it's not a fence post. It's a finish line. It's heaven, it's a golden shore, whatever you want to refer to it as. So when you get your marching orders this morning, I don't know military term because I wasn't in it, but buck up, be strong, and when it's time to march, march. Thank you for your attention this morning. some men and ladies that do want to help set up, that'd be great. We're going to move some chairs around here and have it here in the auditorium in the two rooms. So uh, looking forward to it. And then at 2 o'clock to 4 p.m., we're going to have bowling. And uh, I think we have about 25 hands. Um, the church is taking care of that. So please do come. Is there any, if there's any more that would like to bowl, let me know too that didn't raise their hand. But we saved for about 25 people, and we can add more. So, anyways, let's just stand right now, and then uh, uh, let's see. Steve Raymond, will you please pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day we have. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and fellowship that we have, and that we can visit with people that preach like you do and love the Lord. Thank you for the food that's being prepared. Yeah. And we pray that you'll always appreciate the work that takes your put into it. Ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Please stay. We're going to have food. We've got some coolers and drinks, water, apple juice. And uh, for those that want to help us move some chairs, that'd be great too. We can kind of start in the back and then we'll bring some tables out. If you can help out, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Wait till they get a few tables. Oh, I 